Balanced field life. I bet you have heard about this expression before, but I promise this is the ultimate class about the subject. Stay tuned and enjoy! Hello folks, welcome back to another video podcast in English of the Aircraft Performance Channel. My name is Thiago Brenner and on this video I'm gonna give you the ultimate class about the expression balanced field life. I know you will enjoy it, so please take this moment to hit the like button, subscribe to the channel if you haven't done yet and activate the notification bell. I'd also like to remind you that everything you're about to see here is available to you on the book Aircraft Performance Weight and Balance. It's available to purchase worldwide either on digital format or paper. Check the link in the description below. And without further ado, let's dive into our main subject. I'll bring here a runway for you. What does the regulation says about minimum requirements for a runway length? Well, the airplane must be able to start the departure, reject takeoff at V1 and stop within the accelerate and stop distance available. It also needs to be able to depart, start the departure and have an engine failure at VEF. For the sake of this uh, example here, let's say it's V1. It is not, I'll address to that on a later video, but let's suppose it is V1. And continue takeoff when, with one engine inoperative, the critical engine. And reach the screen height before the end of the takeoff distance available. The airplane must also be able to depart with nothing going wrong and after reaching 35 feet, that is the screen height, having at least 15% of this uh, length that was used until this point is still available in front of it. We'll call this the all engine takeoff distance or simply all engine goal, the accelerate and stop distance and the one engine inoperative takeoff distance, or simply the engine out go. The all engine takeoff distance is not changed by V1 at all, but the other two are affected, are largely affected by V1. The accelerate and stop distance, it's a kind of straightforward thing. If you have a low V1, you can accelerate to that speed very quickly and also stop within a very short distance. If you have a higher V1, you need a longer runway to reach this V1 and then you also need a longer distance to be able to stop. So low V1 is a short accelerate and stop distance. A higher V1, it's a longer accelerate and stop distance. But what people sometimes don't get is why V1 affect the engine out goal distance. And for that, I'm going to bring you here a scale. This scale is not what you think. It does not measure distance. It just states at any point of the runway at which speed the airplane is. For example, when you read 80 on the scale, that means that at this point of the runway, the airplane is already at 80 knots. I know that the scale should not be linear, the acceleration is not a constant thing, but for the purpose of our example, it will serve well. So, let's take now three different examples of V speeds. The only difference between those speeds is the V1. VR and V2 is 140 and 145 for all three examples. Let's say that the letter A represents a standard value of V1, 130 knots, the letter B a low value of V1, 125, and the letter C a high value of V1, 135. So let's move on and see where the airplane will reach the 35 foot point and V2 on every one of these three examples. On the first example, the airplane starts to accelerate until V1 of 130 knots, and let's suppose the airplane will have its engine failed at this speed and continue the acceleration with one less engine operating. As this is a twin engine on my example, 
we can understand or we can predict that the acceleration will drop by something about 70 to 75 percent. So we can no longer use the same scale. I'll put now a different scale here for a one engine in operative acceleration. Now we must identify on this other scale how much speed we still need to gain until reaching VR and V2. On example A we need still another 10 knots to reach VR and a further 5 knots to reach V2 and we'll reach V2 at this point of the runway. Now let's change V1 in just 5 knots. 5 knots slower than the previous standard V1. Now it is 125. Well, now I have not 10 knots to accelerate until VR, but 15. And another 520 in total to reach V2. So V2 is going to be reached at this point of the runway. You can see that I used more field length to accelerate into V2 than I used in previous example. Finally, on letter C, I'll have to accelerate into V1 of 135. And now I'm operating with one engine failure. And I only have to accelerate a further 5 knots to VR and another 5 into V2. And V2 will be reached at this point of the runway. So as you can see here, when you have a low value of V1, you are far away from VR and V2. And you will take much longer to reach those speeds as you are accelerating on one engine only. This is a twin jet. When you have a higher value of V1, you are very close to VR and V2. So you need just a small part of your acceleration on one engine only. And that means your takeoff distance, your engine out takeoff distance will be shorter. Now let's bring a balance to our schematic here. You have go on one side and stop on the other side. And V1 is the asset that will define how this balance is going to work. When we have a high V1, we have a long accelerating stop distance, but a short engine out go distance. On the other hand, when we have a low V1, we have a short accelerating stop distance with a long engine out go distance. So there is a V1 that brings some balance to this equation and makes both distances the engine out go and the accelerator and stop equal. The V1 that brings balance to the equation is called the balance V1. And the situation is called the balance field length. Note that the balance field length has nothing to do with the runway itself. It refers to the condition of the airplane, what the airplane is using for both situations, accelerate and stop, and engine out go. And this is one confusion that is normally made by people out there. Suppose we have here a runway with ASDA, TORA and TORA all the same. That means that this runway is balanced. No, not necessarily, because once again the expression balance V1 does not refer to the runway, it refers to the airplane. And if the airplane has a takeoff distance greater than the accelerate and stop distance, the runway, despite having all the available distance equal, is not balanced. And that can go the other way. The airplane can have the accelerate and stop distance greater than the takeoff distance on this same runway. Another confusion sometimes pilots used to make is that having a balanced field length does not mean you are using all the runway available. Now we have a balanced field length because takeoff distance and accelerate stop distance are the same, but there is a still runway available for us. And if you don't have a balanced field length, it also does not mean that you have runway to spare. In this example, the runway is not balanced, V1 is higher than the balance V1, Therefore, the acceleration stop distance is higher than the takeoff distance and our accelerate and stop distance has used all the accelerate and stop distance available on this runway. Well, folks, let me just remember you that everything that you have just seen here is available to you at the Aircraft Performance Weight and Balance book. It's close to 500 illustrations just to put all this content into a very simple way. It is available to purchase worldwide 
on ebook or paper format, link on the description below. If you enjoyed the subject here of the, of the video, please remember to hit the like button, subscribe to the channel if you haven't done yet, and activate the notification bell. Follow me on my social media. Thanks a lot, and I see you next time.